good news and bad news have, have been on my head all week. Um, so I looked up some good news, bad news jokes. A dad finally relented and let his son take out his brand new, super expensive car for a drive. His son returns and says, good news, dad, the airbags definitely work. (laughs) A doctor comes into the hospital room, comes up to the patient lying in the bed and says, well, I've got good news and bad news, which which do you want first? The patient says, I guess, give me the bad news first. We're going to have to amputate both your legs. Well, what's the good news? The patient in the bed next door has offered to buy your sneakers. <laughs> the definition of gospel is literally good news. But good news to who? Well, we'd like to think everyone. And maybe that's true, but it doesn't always feel like good news to everyone. And in fact, whether or not news is good or bad can differ on who is hearing the news and their own circumstances and what they believe or understand. In the Gospel of Luke particularly, the good news is specifically good news to those on the margins, the poor, the sick, the disenfranchised, the outcasts. Those on the margins, those that society, for whatever reason, have deemed less than or unworthy. So what does that mean to the people on top of society? To those with the power, to those with the money, to those with the jobs and the status? To those with the privilege, is it good news to them? Maybe not. To this point in the gospel, as we get to chapter 6 here, it's implicit that maybe that good news isn't as good to those people because it's explicitly been said by Jesus and by Mary and her Magnificat who the good news is for. And so implicitly, maybe we can understand that some won't be so thrilled with this good news. But at this point in the gospel, it hasn't been explicitly stated. And honestly, in our churches today, it's not very often explicitly stated either. Especially in our white American churches Because the answer to the question of who particularly is this good news to doesn't always feel like good news to us. But in our scripture this morning, it is explicitly laid out who the good news is for and what that means for those not in those categories. Woe to you. Who are rich. Woe to you who are full. Woe to you who laugh. Woe to you who everything goes right for. In Matthew, of course, the Beatitudes are well known and we look at them often and they come from the Sermon on the Mount. Which makes sense, right? Jesus goes up higher and Matthew loves mountains. Right? And there's a strong um, theological deal with mountains in the Bible, right? Mount Sinai, going up to, to commune with God. Plus, it's probably easier if you've got a lot of people to be higher up, to be able to look down on them and have your voice carry to them. It makes sense, the Sermon on the Mount. But Luke explicitly tells us that Jesus comes down from the mount to give this sermon. At the beginning of verse 6, he goes up on the mountain to pray. But as we get to this point, 
He comes down to a level place, it says, where they are. He comes down to their level. Part of this is because Luke is trying to show that Jesus is responding to God's direction that he got in prayer, right? Jesus goes up to be in prayer with God. We can assume he communes with God. God's like, yep, you're doing what I want you to do. Now go do it. And Jesus comes back down to do it. Like Moses came back down from the mount with the Ten Commandments. But it, <laughs> it also embodies what this message from Jesus and God is. It's a leveling out. It's bringing equality to the inequality of the world, right? A reordering of the earthly order, putting right side up everything that the world has turned upside down. When Luke announces that Jesus is coming through John the Baptist, he quotes Isaiah and talks about the mountains being brought down low and the valleys being raised up high. And so we get that where Jesus comes down to the same level of everyone else. So the message that he's giving is literally embodied in his action. And then in the Beatitudes and Woes, we get that sentiment laid out before us explicitly. Blessed are the poor, but woe to you who are rich. Blessed are the hungry, but woe to you who are full. Blessed are those who cry, but woe to those of you who laugh. Blessed are those who are hated, but woe to those of you who everything goes right for and everyone loves. Jesus, in acting God's plan, is working to reorganize the way that we view and interact with the world, working to reorganize the way society works. And this is the theme throughout Luke. Mary told us this in her, in her Magnificat right after she finds out that she's going to bring Jesus into the world. And Jesus tells us this in his mission statement when he returns home to the temple in Nazareth. But here it's explicitly laid out from both sides, not just from the side of the poor and the disenfranchised and the margins, but what it means to everyone else too. The good news to the poor might not be so welcome when you're rich. And God's plan for the world is the very same today. Jesus' mission that we claim to be a part of as the church is unchanged today, putting right side up what the world has turned upside down. So that's good news to the victims of gun violence. But it's woe to those who put their idolatry of guns over people's lives. It's good news to the immigrants and the refugees. But it's woe to those who would build a shrine to white supremacy in the guise of a wall. It's good news to LGBTQI+, to equality in the church and society for all. But it's woe to those who believe that God hates the exact same people that they do. It's good news to our sisters and brothers of color who face unproportionate prejudice, especially when it comes to law enforcement and judicial proceedings. But it's woe to the systemic racism that has protected and privileged white people at the expense of everyone else. It's good news to the poor, but it's woe to the fact that the 26 richest people in the world, according to a report from Oxfam that came out this week, the 26 richest people in the world own as much as the poorest half of the world. 3.8 billion people combined. The 26 richest people in the world have as much as 3.8 billion people combined. 
Woe to those of you who are rich. The way that the world is set up is not beneficial to the majority of the world. And we are part of that system. We benefit from that system. We're privileged by that system. We propagate that system. But we're called to dismantle it. We're called to celebrate the mountains being brought down and the valleys being lifted up. We don't talk about these woes very often. The Beatitudes we preach on all the time. And do you notice how Matthew kind of softens them a little bit too? It's not blessed are the poor in Matthew, the way it is in Luke. It's blessed are the poor in spirit. Matthew's even scared of it. But Luke comes right out and says, not only blessed are the poor, but woe to the rich. We don't talk about these woes very often because, let's be honest, it's calling us out. We are the rich. We are the full. We are the ones who are thought well of in this society. What does that mean to us? We might feel threatened by these woes. We should feel threatened by these woes. And we might feel called out when people decry white privilege. We might feel threatened when people decry toxic masculinity. We might want to say, well, hashtag not all men. Or hashtag not all white people. But if we want to be part of the good news, if we want to be part of the gospel, if we want to be part of what God and Jesus are doing in this world, turning right side up everything that society and we have turned upside down, if we want to be part of the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven, the way that we pray for it every week, It isn't a joke. It is good news, even if it doesn't feel like it to us. It is good news that my sneakers can help someone else. It isn't a joke. It is good news that airbags work because the sun should be more important than the car. And those who don't have the benefits that we have are more important than our privilege and our place in society. It's good news that the poor have a preferential place in the kingdom of God. And that the rich will no longer be privileged. That the hunger will be fed and that the full won't hoard all the food. That those crying out for justice will be heard. And our children won't fear that a gunman will keep them from ever coming home again when they leave for school in the morning. That sexual orientation or gender identity or the color of your skin won't dictate how you're treated by society or the police or the justice system. That the world will once again be right side up rather than the upside down that society claims is the way it always has been and always shall be. What woes aren't worth that reality? How selfish do we have to be not to prefer that? When you see it from God's perspective, the good news far outweighs the bad. Amen. Thank you.